Welcome to the Nobody Guide to Life, where we provide tips and tools for personal growth, personal development, and your spiritual journey that you can use right now in your everyday life. I'm J.A. Plosker. You can always find out more at the thenobodyguidetolife.com, or you can check us out at Twitter and Facebook at Nobody's View, or you can join our Facebook group, Simple Spirituality. Thank you so much for joining us. Sometimes the world seems geared to present difficulties, even if all of our spiritual and personal growth readings and discussions tell us otherwise that the world is a friendly place or that, that everything happens for a reason, it can feel like the universe isn't always on our side. And this feeling, I guarantee, wells up in all of us once in a while. The view gets hazy and, and it, can be, it can be hard to see clearly through the fog. So where do we go when it gets to be too much? Well, we can go into the books and our spiritual practices to help us find discipline and clarity. And we can also find a coach to help us stay accountable for our actions. Or... We can find someone who can bring their passion for the brain, biology, human behavior, and communication to help us get our lives into alignment. Someone like today's guest. Brooke Sproul is the founder, CEO, and clinical director of My LA Therapy. She brings over a decade of experience to helping individuals, couples, and families dealing with relationship issues, codependency, anxiety, and depression, as well as concerns ranging from post-traumatic stress disorder to obsessive compulsive disorder. She's currently developing her new book, Why You Should Date Emotionally Unavailable Men. Use your unhealthy relationship to transform yourself and your love life. And welcome to the show, Brooke. Oh, thank you so much. What a lovely introduction. Oh, well, thank you. <laughs> it's, you've got a fantastic background. You really, you really have a lot of interests in that therapy space. And I guess the first question for me naturally is, what inspired you to become a therapist? Did you always have an interest in all those different things? When did that happen? Yeah, I think it's sort of who I am. Like there was, it reminds me of that old movie. Um, was it Rounders with Matt Damon? And he's talking to his college professor and uh, his law professor. And his law professor says, you know, my father was a rabbi and my father's father was a rabbi and his father was a rabbi. And so, of course, it was expected that I would be a rabbi. And uh he said when he chose to, to become a professor, his entire family disowned him and he never yeah. spoke to them again. And he said, and Matt Damon says, you know, if you had to do it again, would you have made the same choice? And the guy goes, what choice? <laughs> um, and I, I love that. I, I think that's such a beautiful, you know, idea um, that kind of touches on all sorts of kind of fun philosophical questions about life and you know free will and fatalism and and all right. that but but to answer your question uh yeah it's sort of who i am i think i i naturally love to self reflect to analyze relationships and people and make deep connections with people to try to understand my inner workings and those of others um and so it it's really natural in that sense and i've suffered from my own mental health issues and right. so you know that journey i think most therapists get into this because you know we we suffer from anxiety and depression and um, different relationship issues or i'll say i i do and and i think most people who get into the field do in part because we're trying to figure out our own lives and our own selves and so it's it's a real gift um there's what's called a parallel process which is the idea that you know there's a parallel process between the work we're doing on ourselves mm. and the work we're doing with our clients. So, right. you know, I feel like what I'm learning in my personal life is constantly being infused into my work with clients and vice versa. What I right. learned from working with clients informs my own life. So there's a real beautiful reciprocity there. Yeah. And, you know, you actually touch on something so, so important for the bigger journeys of spiritual and personal growth is you don't start a journey of personal growth because you're grown. You know, you're, right. it's not just gurus. You know, people don't just are not born on mountaintops where they become gurus. You start the journey because you want to do the work. And sometimes I think we hold therapists, counselors to a different standard. We expect that they're going to be <laughs> perfect. And that's why we're coming to them. Well, how do you handle that? You know, what do you think about that? Well, it's funny. What that reminds me of is early in my career. So I was pretty young when I graduated grad school. I was probably 25 or something. Right. Um, so I was probably in private practice right around then, 25, 26, something like that. And, uh, you know, I wanted to be taken seriously, you know, right. and, and I was bright and I was passionate and I was a good therapist. I mean, I still have clients who come back to me, you know, eight years later from that time, even though I've changed and grown so much. So I know there was something real genuine that people, 
you know, experience from me, even at that time. But as I look back, I would, you know, I was dressed so professionally. I would have my hair back in a bun. You know, I sat up straight with my legs crossed and my, my hands crossed. You know, I had this sort of formal, you know, yeah. presentation. And now it's like, I have wavy hair, you know, I wear <laughs> jeans, I'm sitting cross-legged, you know, so it's, it's as I've kind of learned that the feedback I've gotten over the years it from long-term clients is the times that were most helpful were the times when you shared something you were struggling with or experienced because right. then I knew I wasn't alone. Right. And it was so surprising to me because I always had the bias of don't make this about you. And, and also you have to seem perfect. Otherwise people are going to think you're a sham. You, right. know, you have to sort of act like you have it all together. And as I've sort of matured in my own kind of spiritual uh, journey and my own psychological journey and my, you know, work with clients, you know, I've just come to, experience the value of just being real and um it's really you know one of the most rewarding or i think one of the most freeing things that i try to teach my team is you know to how do i say this um to make there be as little contrast between the you you are in the rest of your life and the right. you you are when you're sitting with your clients right. so i teach them or try i try to teach them um to uh, to make it so that there is as little contrast between themselves outside of therapy and inside right. of therapy and to be able to bring, instead of that sort of stereotypical notion of like the therapist behind the desk with their notepad right. kind of writing cryptically and, you know, in silent judgment, you know, I try to teach my therapist, how do we neutrally communicate all of our, our thoughts and observations to the client? Because that's the feedback that they're craving, right. you know, so I'll encourage them to say to someone who's suffering from, you know, narcissistic issues, I'll encourage them to call them out and say, you know, wondering, do you see any narcissism here? Instead of this sort of like, you know, therapist, okay, I'm diagnosing you with narcissism. <laughs> you know, it's like, like really bring that to the client. It's like they, people are, are in therapy because they're in a state where they've been humbled enough to say, what I am doing is not working. Right. I need another way. And if we are walking on eggshells and not being fully transparent, um, we're really doing a disservice to our clients. So how do we communicate in as neutral and non-judgmental a way as possible, um, you know, what we're seeing? And I think when we truly aren't judging these things because, for example, I've struggled with my own narcissism. I've done a lot of work on, in therapy on that. And, you know, so I don't have a lot of judgment about it. I go, this is a compensation for deep-seated insecurity. And this right. is something that this person was trained to do. They don't have any other tools. This is probably just what they, you know, had modeled for them. So because I don't judge it, I can communicate it in a way that a client can hear without feeling judged. Um, and I think that's a really um, valuable skill as a therapist. Well, that's important because the skills we develop ourselves over time and continue to develop are the skills that we can teach. You know, people benefit from a therapist who's been to a therapist. People, yep. you're right. People, Back to the parallel process. Right. So when it comes to your spiritual journey, your, your journey of personal growth as an individual, how do you bring those ideas then into your practice? Because sometimes I think people think they're being judged when we bring up spirituality or personal growth sometimes, and even a therapeutic context. I think sometimes the client thinks they're being judged in some way. How do you bring in spirituality, personal growth into those interactions so that people feel that you're being genuine and that they feel free to express themselves? Well, I think that one of the things I learned early on in my training um, was kind of an adaptive um, striving model of pathology. So things that we think of as pathological or, you know, wrong in some way to, to frame them in the context of how they developed and, and that, that they were actually adaptive mechanisms mm. at the time. Yes. So I'll say a little bit more about what that means because it's sort of abstract, I recognize. Um, you know, if you, the metaphor that I like to use is if you went off to war um, and you develop, you know, you, you carried around a semi-automatic weapon all the time, uh, that was an, you know, you needed that weapon in, in the war. That was an right. adaptive necessity. Um, but if you come back to the States after the war and you carry it into the grocery store, um, you know, now it's no longer adaptive. 
but but it's not wrong you know it's not right. the fact that you develop this it was a necessary thing that has become obsolete mm -hmm. and so when i think when we truly don't judge it people don't feel judged like when we truly have a framework from which to understand it that is not pathologizing that can see these things in context then it's very easy to you know have the client not feel judged because i'm not judging them so right. and if there is judgment then that can be a projection um and we explore the projection you know and i'll say oh you know that's really interesting you know tell me where that's coming from and we kind of go into usually it's their own self judgment kind of projected onto the therapist but kind of more specifically answering your questions about uh, spirituality. Um, you know, I think that uh, it's interesting. There's so many parallels between kind of the, the Eastern kind of Buddhist mindfulness meditation truths and psychology. Right. And often there's really just, it's just a different linguistic framework. Right. It's right. not actually a real difference in philosophy or mm -hmm. even sometimes practice. I mean, obviously there are some differences, but um, there's a lot of overlap. And even within the therapeutic field, there's a lot of overlap because in terms of, you know, this methodology, that methodology, they'll have different words for the same concepts. Um, so, you know, when I talk about like regulating anxiety, um, you know, and paying attention to the body, I mean, it's really just a form of mindfulness. Right. Um, it's not. It's not actually fundamentally different. It just may be using a different uh, linguistic framework. And for people who are more geared spiritually, I tend to use a more spiritual language and framework. You know, I'll, I'll incorporate. Um, you know, mindfulness and meditation. Um, but that doesn't resonate with everyone. And so, it's, right. and it's really important that we kind of use a language that we kind of develop a common language with our clients that we both can understand and and speak and so it really just depends on the person and how how spiritually minded they are like i've done you know some work with clients on the concept of surrender and they just they hate that word it, 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 <laughs> you know they don't get it they they have like horrible connotations with it but it was funny i, I had a client a long time ago and we uh, I used to kind of push her on it and, and, and eventually, you know, months later she was like, Oh, I get it now. You know, she's like, no, just not my word. I don't like it. And then, and I was like, I think there's more to it, but I kind of gave up, I kind of surrendered. And then, um, and then she months later was like, Oh, it's surrender. Yes. That's exactly what I did. Isn't that so, so interesting? Yeah. Because, because what you're speaking to is such an interesting thing about nomenclature, about how we, we see this diversity of spiritual practice. We see the diversity of world religions that come down to us from ancient times. And we, we think we have to, sometimes we think we have to pick and choose among them or we can't, we can't plant a flag in one camp because we might alienate others. And I think what you're saying is a really valuable lesson about really seeing the value in practice beyond what it's called. And you know that's I think so important, especially in a therapeutic relationship to meet the client where they are and to help them use the vocabulary that's going to promote healing for them, not yeah. for you. And that's part of being authentic as a therapist is saying, hey, you know, it's fine. You know my truth. I know your truth. And, and let's just go from here. Well, yeah, letting go of our agenda mm -hmm. and kind of submitting to what feels right to the client rather than having to be right. And, right. you know, kind of the ego surrender that you know, <laughs> that we, we've we kind of touched upon as well, you know, the ego surrender of, you know, you have to adapt to my framework because I'm the expert. I mean, right. one of my main goals is to dethrone myself as the expert and to go, you know, <laughs> we're, two, we're two humans in this together. And I happen to have some special training and expertise that can help guide you. Um, but it's not that I'm in any position of superiority. I just happen right. to have a, a, a skill set that can be helpful to you. Um, but it's not a hierarchy in any sense. That was an important way when I was doing a group and individual therapy of establishing rapport. And I think a lot of times when we're in school training to be counselors, therapists, sometimes we, we read those chapters really fast. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Establishing rapport. But that's actually the most important piece of the relationship because that's where, that's where we build the trust. That's where we build the mm -hmm. reputation as not an advice giver, 
but a partner yes. in healing. And I think it's so different. That's such a huge crossover with spirituality in so many ways. You know, I, trying to talk someone onto our side. You know, mindfulness is all about trying to just accept this moment. And I think therapy is so much about just trying to accept the client. And I don't know, how do you see that come up for you? Uh, how do I see coming to, can you say that again? Yeah. How do you see clients responding to that kind of dynamic? Do, do you find that clients really want advice giving sometimes or, or are they uncomfortable with a partnership model? Um, I would say that sometimes clients, you know, it, it's a defense mechanism that mm. clients will go, tell me what to do. Right. You know, um, cause they don't want to take responsibility for making the choice. Um, and so, you know, and it's like, what's the answer? You know, they right. like want to want to skip to like this, like nice, you know, is there, you know, a five step plan that we can do to <laughs> right. make this go away? You know, and, and what I try to respond to is that just the pain and the distress of living in the uncertainty. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's really life is really hard. <laughs> and yeah. I wish I had a magic wand and I wish I had a three step plan to perfection. And I wish, you know, and, and it's really hard to sit with this discomfort. Um, and and, you know, if people do and I, I would say it's it's not you know, all the time that people want this, but, you know, it comes up from time to time. And, um, you know, people uh, I'll kind of just say, you know, if even if I, you know, were to just tell you what to do and even if I, I made the right choice, you know, it actually wouldn't help you right. for me to just tell you what to do. Um, how do I explain this? If if the choice isn't coming from them, mm -hmm. it's not actually healing. If they're just sure. going, you know, going through the behavior, um, there's no actual transformation. I see it, this may not be the perfect concept to express it, but I see it as a little bit like give a man a fish versus teach a man to fish. Sure. Um, you know, it's like, I don't want to just have, you know, a, you know, legion of soldiers that are just <laughs> obeying my commands. Like that's gross, right? <laughs> like I, I want to teach someone the skills to, and to develop the skills to fight for themselves. I don't want somebody who's just, you know, um, carrying out orders kind of from an empty state. I want to, you know, I, I, I used to, I grew up um, religious, as I mentioned to you, um, you know, in the call before. Um, and I remember a pastor said, you know, it's not about, um, what it, gosh, he, he said it beautifully. He said something about, it's not about like not sinning. It's about becoming the kind of people to whom sin is no longer appealing. Interesting. And I love that. And I think that, you know, sin, I think, is a word that doesn't resonate with a lot of people. It has a lot of, you know, um, negative connotations. But if we really think of sin in the, in, uh, if we take it out of the fundamentalist modern con conceptualization of it, um, and we put it into the actual original meaning in the scriptures, which is missing the mark, right. um, we go, oh, yeah, becoming the kind of person to whom it's not appealing, for example, to... Um, like addictive behaviors aren't appealing or using others isn't appealing or, you know, it's like, like that makes sense if right. we don't put it in this sort of moralistic, you know, right, wrong, you know, this, that. But if we really look at it in the deeper sense, I think there's something really profound to that. Well, there is. And, and I just, I, 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 I love how that sounds. And I love the idea of just, because when you reframe things as missing the mark, you know, even the most seasoned archery professional Yep. started off with the suction cup bow and arrow <laughs> missing the thing. That's how everyone starts. And the metaphor mm. for the spiritual and personal journey is, is really strong there. It's about constantly pulling arrows out and shooting them again and again, and then becoming the kind of person who doesn't even occur to you that you're not going to hit the target. Right. And I think that's powerful. I, I am curious, though, to hear you talk about how you weave all this into your practice. How did all of that lead to to your book. Now I'm going to read the title again. It's really interesting. Why you should date emotionally unavailable men. Use your unhealthy relationships to transform yourself and your love life. So how did that book idea that you're working on, how did that grow out of the things that we're talking about, out of your practice? I mean, really, it, it came from my own personal journey in therapy and, and a relationship with a man who I knew from literally the moment he opened his mouth, the first time I saw him, <laughs> he said the first thing out of his mouth, I won't repeat it, but he said something and I went, 
oh, nope, I will never date that guy. I'll never, <laughs> I'll never, you know, I'll never go out with that guy. He just didn't seem like a good dude. And he wasn't. And, uh, and I, I knew that. Um, but we began spending time together and seeing each other three or four times a week and became really close friends. And I, I totally, I was totally out of touch with any interest in him at the time. And then one day he said, you know, would you ever want to go out with me? And I, it was like, oh my God, all of these feelings that were there all along just kind of flooded me. And I realized, oh, I really liked this person, but I had sort of told myself that this guy is bad for me, so I'm not going to date him. And again, I I knew I wasn't going to end up with him. I never even wanted to end up with him, but I kept finding myself inexplicably drawn to this guy. Hmm. And I, and even when, you know, he would do something terrible to me and then I'd break up with him. And then a year later we'd reconnect. And what happened is it really just me telling myself, this is an emotionally unavailable man and I deserve, you know, (laughs) blah, blah, blah. And this sort of what I call the false goddess mentality, you know, of of this sort of narcissistic approach to relationships. You know, I'm a queen and, you know, it's like, I didn't feel that way, but that's what like the culture was telling me, you know, if you act that way, then you'll find what you're looking for in relationships. Um, You know, I think that, uh, so, so this, um, this relationship that, that transpired, it lasted on, it was on and off for six years wow. because I kept going, this is bad. And if I just, you know, leave it him and if I just white knuckle it and do the right thing. And if I just, you know, because he's bad, um, then I'll, uh, then I'll find what I'm looking for. But what would happen is I left the relationship before I really was done with it and before I had learned the lessons I needed to learn from it. Hmm. And I think that prolonged the process so much. If I had just allowed myself to surrender and say, you know what, uh, I know I'm not going to end up with this guy, but clearly I've got some lessons to learn about myself here. Right. Um, I think it would have been a year or two process max, you know, right. but it was that push pull that prolonged yes. everything and, um, and didn't, and, and didn't give me the, sense to take responsibility for how I was creating and sustaining the problematic dynamics in the relationship. I kept scapegoating him because I had been fed this cultural narrative about unavailable men rather than saying, what's mine here? You know, what do I have to look at? And, and I, I mean, not that I wasn't asking those questions, but the answer was always, well, you like unavailable men. That's your problem. (laughs) And that's the easy, that's the easy answer. And that's the answer we all sort of settle for. But I didn't, that didn't give me anything. And, and in the long run, as I surrendered to, and just went, you know, I've got to just be in this, even though it's quote bad. Um, gosh, there was just so much I learned about myself and my blind spots and my poor communication. I had no idea that I was being manipulative in my communication, that I was really indirect and passive. I had no idea how much I was censoring what I really needed and wanted to try to preserve the relationship. I had no idea, you know, how uh, I, I could be really kind of um, demanding instead of in terms of like how I needed to be treated instead of, uh, or maybe demanding isn't quite the right word, but um, uh, critical rather than mm. um, rather than vulnerable. Like, hey, I'm hurting here. As right. you know, well, no, you need to do this different. You know, you're the problem. So there were all these attitudes of mine that were masked um, by me scapegoating this guy and um, blaming him for all the issues in our relationship. Um, and the upshot was, you know, once I really started to own my voice and stop censoring and ask for what I needed, it just became so clear that he couldn't give that to me. And there was no charge anymore. When I, when I ended the relationship, Mm. finally, it was like the magnetism had gone away. Cause that, you know, that sort of, um, I call it broken magnet syndrome, (laughs) Um, you know, the sort of broken magnet syndrome. It's like, you know, our wounds kind of align in some complementary way that gives us this incredible, you know, false synthetic connection that, that um, substitutes for real intimacy and real vulnerability. And so, you know, once, once I started changing my contribution, there wasn't that pull anymore. And when I walked away, it wasn't punitive. It wasn't like, I'm done, you know, and trying to punish him and, you know, kind of extort him into being different because he, <laughs> he didn't want to lose me, which never worked. Right. Um, uh, you know, and it just, it, I, I ended up being the fool. 
Um, and it was really like, oh, no, I'm really done. And there's no hard feelings. It's like, we're just different. And we just right. don't, we're just not right for each other. And it wasn't angry. And it wasn't, you know, and it wasn't even that sad at that point. It was kind of like, okay, you know, this right. just doesn't feel right. Right. And it takes, you know, this is so powerful because it connects back to what you were saying at the start of the interview about the power of like radical non-judgment because it takes, you have to work yourself into a seat where you can observe things from a different place rather than getting wrapped up in, like you said, a social, sociocultural narrative. You have to put yourself in a seat, almost like a judge, where you can observe what's happening so that you can make the best decisions that are going to help you grow instead of constantly running from the situation or wishing it was something other than it was. You know, right. you know Brooke, it makes me think of people who write to uh, advice columnists and the solution is so easy. Like my coworker, you know, yeah. <laughs> uh, talks too much. What should I do? Well, there's no magic button for that. <laughs> you have to grow and handle that situation for what it, for what it is. And sometimes there's no, there is no easy way. There is no magic wand. There is yeah. getting into the seat of objectivity and examining the situation. That's a very interesting story. So w when is the book, do, are you, you're working on this now? So I've written the book, except for the conclusion chapter. I'm kind of reworking it with, um, you know, my own, developing some of my own terminology for things. Like right. I've kind of thrown in the, a couple examples like false goddess syndrome and broken, or false goddess mentality, broken ma magnet syndrome and different um, terminologies just to make it a little bit more mine. Right. right now, some of the concepts are more general and I'm trying to kind of just make it more interesting to read by adding a little bit more of some metaphorical language. Um, and so I'm reworking it in that sense. And then I'm also simultaneously working on the book proposal, query letter, and um, and the sa sample chapters to submit for um, to a publisher. Um, I have an agent who's interested in it. So, you know, depending on how long that takes, I may just end up self-publishing. Um, you know, once, once I get a version of it that I'm a final version that I'm happy with, right. you know, I may just kind of put it out because, and then see if a publisher picks it up after the fact. So I don't really know the timeline, unfortunately, I'm hoping to get it published in the next couple months, but I know, um, I know that the, if I go the traditional route that it will take a lot longer than that probably. Um, but you can um, sign up to be notified um, of the release. Uh, if you sign up on the uh, wait list, there's a page on my website. It's just mylatherapy.com okay. slash why you should date emotionally unavailable men. And those are all hyphenated. <laughs> um, I think it might actually be slash book too. There's like, I don't know how it all, all the technology works, but um, <laughs> you, people can find it if they, they can also just email me. Um, and, and then you guys can be kept in the loop. And I promise not to spam anyone with anything else in, um, other than book information, unless you want to be added to our newsletter or anything like that, you can specify that. Okay, so, you know, this is such a great conversation about non-judgment, authenticity, the power of surrender, and it really is well encapsulated in, in that Why You Should Date book. And I, so I'm really interested to hear a tip or tool that you can give us based on all of this, based on your own journey, that we can use on our journeys right now, right at the end of this episode. I think that the most important skill that one can bring into relationships and really all of life is to become an astute um, observer uh, of your own anxiety mm. um, and to learn to regulate it, to learn first to recognize it because a lot of people don't even know they're anxious. Um, and <laughs> I'm laughing because I don't want to say this on a podcast. So. <laughs> So um, I'm a little distracted because I don't usually censor myself, but I was just, it came to mind. My father said the other day, I'm not an anxious person. I'm not anxious at all. I was just like, okay, dad, <laughs> sure, sure you are. <laughs> Everyone on the planet is some level. <laughs> anyway, um, so, so the most important thing we can do is to become an astute uh, student of our own anxiety. Anxiety can manifest itself in so many different ways. Um, you know, and, and one of the signs that we're anxious is when we feel a sense of urgency and speed around something. Interesting. And, and the, the, 
impulse of anxiety is to speed up, right. but the invitation of anxiety is to slow down. Hmm. And that's the spiritual way, right? The spiritual way is rather than acting on this, what can feel like uh, an impossible uh, urge to resist or an irresistible urge, um, rather than acting on it, we go, okay, I'm going to tolerate the urgency, the difficulty of holding that. And I'm going to sit and I'm going to slow down and I'm going to find out what's here. Because so often, you know, when our, our nervous systems are in a state of high anxiety, it's kind of that fight or flight mode. And we tend to see things in more black and white ways. We tend to communicate in ways that are distorted and unfair. We don't give people the benefit of the doubt. Uh, we tend to blame others because we're feeling threatened. So we're kind of trying to protect ourselves by going on the attack. Uh, if we learn uh, the signs that we're anxious um, and the ways that that comes out, we can slow ourselves down. And once we're calm, our communication is naturally more um, fair, balanced, uh, kind. You know, they've done studies. Uh, the Gottman Institute has done studies on um, with couples. And if you have couples in the middle of a fight, stop and read for 20 minutes, they tend to come back with more humor um, and compassion. Uh, and it tends to really change the communication. So that's one of the main things I do with couples in therapy is I teach them, I stop them, you know, when I notice, you know, I'm trained to uh, identify signs of unconscious anxiety. So I'll stop them. And again, most of the time they don't even realize they're anxious. Right. And that's when things become combustible in relationships uh, is when two people are both highly anxious and they don't realize it. And then they just start to go in circles and then it gets, it escalates. And, you know, so I stop them. Um, I, take the temperature, you know, how high is your anxiety from one to 10? All right, let's get it below a five before we continue. And I'll keep stopping them and kind of, and that, that process, it's almost like a, like coach with a sport. Like, right. you know, I play volleyball. It's like, you know, you hit the ball, no snap your wrist. And, you know, the coach has to kind of keep reminding you before, and you have to keep having those, those reps before the muscle memory becomes natural. Right. Um, before your body internalizes this. So a big part of good therapy, which I think it's really hard to find a good therapist. And I encourage people who've been in therapy before and haven't had a good experience to uh, understand that not all therapists are created equal. Right. And that uh, just because it hasn't worked for you before doesn't mean that it can't be helpful. You just have to hold out for the right fit and trust your gut on that. And a lot of people go, oh, this person's the expert. So you know, I'm just going to defer to them instead of trusting their instincts about whether or not this person is actually helpful for them. So, you know, I, I think it's really important for people to um, recognize that uh, there are a lot of different ways that people practice therapy. And it's a lot like dating. Right. You don't give up on dating and relationships just because you go on one bad date <laughs> or you have one bad relationship. It really takes time to find the right therapist. I mean, I probably went through 10 before I found mine. Um, and so, so please don't write off all therapists based on, you know, even more than one bad experience with a therapist because, you know, it just takes a while to find the right fit. And unfortunately, there's a lot of, you know, broken people in this industry. And I'm not saying that we all aren't broken, but there's some people who haven't learned how to maybe manage that in a way that um, allows for them to be, to practice in a way that can really be powerful and healing to others. Yeah, and I would say the same goes for your spiritual teachers, teachers in mm -hmm. personal growth. I found a teacher that I studied with for over 20 years. But then as I was studying with that teacher, I found other people that I didn't resonate with. Well, I didn't give up on the whole thing. Right. So you just, you, just, you just can't give up. If this is something you're committed to, if spiritual growth or healing is something you're committed to, then it's a journey you have to continue. So that brings us to the end of this episode of the Nobody Guide to Life. Brooke, thank you so much for being on the show. I know you've got a very busy practice out there in L.A., and I really appreciate your time. Oh, it was such an absolute pleasure speaking with you. Thank you so much. And I want to remind our listeners, it is possible to believe spiritually that the world, humanity, the universe is ultimately friendly and that everything happens for a reason. 
but at the same time feel from a human perspective that things are difficult and present circumstances can feel anything but friendly. We all have the power to feel what we feel and take action. Whatever road you choose to find peace or wellness, give yourself to it. Embrace that path because in the end, it's part of the greater journey that unifies all of us. You can find out more about Brooke and her practice at mylatherapy.com or on Twitter and Facebook at mylatherapy. The links will be in our show notes at thenobodyguidetolife.com. And you can always find out more about what we're doing at thenobodyguidetolife.com or you can reach out to us on Twitter and Facebook at Nobody's View. Or join our Facebook community, Simple Spirituality. If you like what you hear on this podcast, please consider a review or subscription. We'd really appreciate it. Keep practicing and have a good week.